Okay. So <clears throat> apparently there's a company called .com that does uh, web hosting and they use Linux containers these days and they released this program called Docker and it's very, very beta, uh, very alpha really, more than beta and basically it's just a Linux containers tool that uh, creates your uh, Linux container and maintains it and has some sort of git backend for keeping a repository of all the different images and stores only the differences between the images so to be more efficient and I thought I'd try it out so went to the docker web website and got a hold of their uh, PP PPA and installed it so this is basically this here is basically one of the images that's on the Docker repository and I've already done this command before so it's already fetched it and basically now this bash terminal is actually in the Linux container and entirely separate machine, different ID, different host name. Uh, if I go to the home directory in this machine you'll see that it's pretty much sure. Hold on. You'll see that it's pretty much empty. And you can actually go in and see the underlying bits and pieces. So in the var lib docker directory, you have this graph directory, and these are my images. So if I go into, I think it was this one, you'll see that you have this layer. And this is only the files that is different from my my main host, my my, my uh, host operating system. So this file system gets overlaid on top of my host operate my host machine's file system, and it then makes that available uh, under this file system. And it was one E, wasn't it? One uh, uh, E. So it's created this file system under here. And root fs. It's created this file system under here, and this is the file system that this container is limited to, locked in on. So if I say, for instance, touch a file system here and I've made this file in my home directory and if I go into here under home, you see the same test thing. This whole container will get thrown away when I stop. No changes get recorded to the base image unless, of course, I wanted to, which I haven't looked into how to do, so I'm not going to demonstrate that. And basically the idea is that it's, it binds these directories together so as to make this temporary uh, root file system that the Linux container then runs in. And anything you do in that Linux container is limited to this file system. But it doesn't actually use extra hard disk space because it's all just your base operating system with this layer of the differences and then whatever changes you make within that VM. You can then save those changes to be a new image. You can upload that image to the repository so the next person can download it. And if, the, if that person that downloads your image already has one of the images that your image is based on, he only has to download the differences between the image that he already has and your image. So it's all like uh, Git, you know, Git does uh, only records the changes between different versions and that sort of thing. So this this uh, hash here is basically the hash key just like a git hash key and the whole point is that you can run your application in a container very easily migrate the containers and all that sort of thing yep time up okay <laughs> thank you very much any questions not that I know too much about it yet <laughs> Do you want
want the machine or? Um, no, I don't have anything to show. So. Okay. Well, that, uh, my name is Ziggy, and it was really convenient having uh, had the Docker presentation just before because this one somehow um, uh, has uh, a few notions in common. Um, I've been a Mac user for the desktop and Linux uh, server for, uh, since 96. Um, and one of my customers um, has a very small uh, business and, and, and they needed to have a backup system and they, they couldn't um, really get trained into um, w one of the available um, uh, backup and restore uh, systems. It was way too complicated for them. And um, having been used to uh, the time machine back backup system for for Mac for for quite a while and being very um, uh, and, and finding it myself very convenient, I decided just to research how um, this backup system um, functioned internally and uh, realized it was a very simple uh, mechanism, mostly using um, rsync and um, hard links. So um, I developed it basically with um, with a bash script and a few configuration files and the, the typical um, uh, way scripts uh, work um, in combination with um, with cron and it has been performing really well on an external um, hard drive for three years now. Um, so I have I haven't um, I've been quite slack and uh, um, didn't uh, provide or package it uh, as an open source solution, but I still have it there. And uh, if anyone is interested uh, to use it for themselves or to um, get this properly packaged so that it's available for uh, for people who might be interested. I didn't research recently if um, anyone has come up with a similar solution, but at the time, um, after a few hours of research, there, had, there, there, there wasn't um, any uh, simple backup solutions for Linux like this. Basically, what it provides is a um, directory with um, full hard drive uh, snapshots, very much in the way Docker um, works by creating the uh, the snapshots or images and storing only the differences um, or the changes made as um, as time was on and um, and uh, changes are made to the file system. Um, this stores in in a directory a number of uh, subdirectories with uh, date and time, and uh, all of them are a full snapshot of the hard drive um, where backup, uh, backups are made, uh, with um, uh, according to the configuration files, so which um, directories are included, which directories are excluded, and uh, um, um, extensions and so forth. Yep. Yep. Um, well, it's it's zero maintenance, and once it's installed, uh, it works beautifully. It can be uh, shared as a as a Samba share, and anyone can access old um, uh, files. There is no um, uh, the the security of the files is copied into the into the backups. So uh, whoever has access to the files. Um, um, in, in the in the actual hard drive, uh, the the same um, permissions will be copied into all the backups, and because of the nature of uh, uh, differential changes between um, every snapshot, uh, one can have um, uh, 
three years of snapshots um, of daily or hourly snapshots in, in the external hard drive using very little more than um, the whole file system itself um, unless uh, unless there, there are lots of changes happening every hour every day so it's not really convenient for backing up uh, I don't know a database perhaps is much better relying on uh, their own backup system Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Fantastic. Well, so someone has done it. So back in time. Okay. Well, uh huh. Sorry? Uh, the lucky, lucky cat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. mm -hmm. Fantastic. Well, it looks like um um, well, having a GUI is, is oriented towards the desktop and a single user, um, and my implementation of, um, of the time machine-like is um, for, for the enterprise or for, for small businesses just to um, not worry about the, the ability to back up or restore and just have peace of mind that uh, the, the external hard drive is not going to run out of space. Uh, when doing the backups, and anyone can restore uh, files very easily at any point in time. Um, it could, if um, if it is set up for uh, set up for that, um, the configuration files you, um, the the administrator can set up which folders to to backup and um, um, filters and so forth. Uh -huh. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> ah, incremental, yeah. Well, if, if anyone is interested in, in using this uh, this script for, for their own uh, small business or any clients, 
board um, would like to give me a hand to um, uh, to properly set it on on um, um, just as an open source um, um, application. Um, I'd be delighted to um, team up with anyone. My email address is ce at rbm.org. Thank you. Um, Okay, next up we have uh, Terence, I believe. Followed by Damon. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Terence. I've been using Linux since about uh, 2008. Um, I've been uh, very much uh, interested in how it works, the underlying um, mechanics of the operating system. Um, even studied quite a few subjects uh, when doing my advanced diploma on it. Um, it um, has a lot of um, excellent advantages, which you all know. Anyway, um, TIM, T, TIMU and TILP are two programs which are basically for the Texas Instruments line of uh, calculators. Now, these are engineering calculators. They're quite specialised. They can do vectors, graphs, and um, all types of different uh, financial calculations, which are probably pretty common for most of us. But they can um, make life a whole lot easier for people who are doing complex electrical calculations, such as um, matricizing determinants and um, uh, electronics, such as a uh, large, large amount of formulas which are required for that. They can be um, aliased in the, in the machine and actually uh, run from the Texas Instruments linker program. Excuse me. But you can run the, the linker program links the calculator, I'm sorry, and the emulator, emu, the emu is the emulator. So you can have the different file systems, or sorry, the different compu uh, configurations of the TI-89, for instance, TI-92 or TI-800s um, in a compressed file, file format and run that on the uh, run that on the TIEMU, and um, you can upload any of the uh, included packages. So you've got the um, the engineering calculations, the mechanical engineering, electronics engineering, uh, and all, all the others, as if it was actually on the screen. Um, this is tremendously advantage advantageous to um, engineers and um, associated uh, people, as they can. Um, well, obviously, make use of having a full screen and uh, using it to um, to use their calculator. Um, now, the um, thing about it is, I haven't used it a hell of a lot. <laughs> I um I use the calculator, and uh, I haven't used the, 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 the linker program. That basically gives you the opportunity to link up with the machine or link up with the computer and um, organize it that way. So um, you have two options where you can go. Um, does anyone have any questions that might want to ask me about it? Yeah. Oh, okay. So actually building the thing inside the computer. Okay, um, what's exactly Octave? Okay, okay, no worries. Um, yeah, there would be. Um, so there wouldn't be a huge amount of advantage for people who already have MATLAB. 
but uh, you could write your own uh, formulas into the machine and then have that uh, packaged into a program and then or put that op upload that to, to, the, to, to the calculator itself and have those calculations ready at hand. So that's one advantage of it. Um, Octave, I don't know if it comes on a smaller calculator. Does that we work with um, HP or someone like that, or HP calculators, or no? Okay. You can. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I suppose you would. Um, the one thing I found that was really handy was matrices, matrices and determinants for electrical. Um, I'm not a massive maths person. What is a matrices and determinant? Well, uh -huh. <laughs> when you um, analyze a circuit, you go, you fault into, you um, you generate it down into loops. I see. It's been a while since I've actually studied circuit analysis. Uh, you generate it, you turn it into loops. And those loops have series of numbers which come basically of the fact that five seconds left, every voltage rise and drop equals zero, and that's Kirchhoff's voltage law. And Kirchhoff's current current law is that um, all currents entering a node will, in fact, leave a node. So, uh, but basically, those determinants uh, are for uh, finding the unknown or the unsolved element in the circuit. Um, so it, it's very boring, <laughs> very complex, and I'm glad I only had to study it once. So I, I, I wouldn't. Yes. Sir. UMC, what's that? Calculator. Okay. Wow. Um, it's got the TI 6800K, uh, 68K, I believe everyone, that's a very common processor. So that's, yeah, I'd say they'd make a client. They almost certainly would have a client of that. Yeah. Um, well, I bought mine for 50 bucks off eBay, and it's a TI 89 titanium. Um, it's scratched to hell. Uh, I've dropped it a couple of times. Um, it came wrapped in a baby's nappy, and it works just fine. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's it's got a bit of a smell. <laughs> a funny plasticky smell. Um, so yeah, it's been great to be back. I I come on and off, and um, yeah, it's. Um, we're going to minus time now, guys. So if you want any more questions to be asked. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I'm number four. I'm talking about virtual GL. I'm not real technical, so I don't actually know all that much technical stuff about virtual gel, but I'll give you an example of like what it can do. I use it to um, play games, uh, like wine games, for example, um, from one machine on my network, um, and I'll have the games running on that machine, and then I'll go to another machine, maybe a laptop or even like uh, you might be able to use a Raspberry Pi or something like that. You can stream the game um, and you can have multiple concurrent users using virtual GL. So you can play, uh, you can set up a server with several video cards and you can have um, multiple users playing multiple different games at once, use, all using the same GPU or multiple different GPUs and you can assign different users to different uh, different, different applications to different GPUs. Um, so yeah, it's pretty nifty. You can you can use it. I've been using it with uh, NX as well because when you connect with NX, uh, as far as I know, there's no way to get 3D acceleration 
uh, in your apps um, when you're connecting with NX. Um, but with Virtual GL, you can run your application and um, Virtual GL will, will display 3D. Um, it'll allow, allow uh, uh, applications in your NX session to, to use OpenGL. Um, yeah, so I'm just wondering if anybody's heard of it. Um, it's been made a bit famous on the internet recently because um, NVIDIA um, had a driver issue with their Optimus, um, I think it's the Optimus uh, laptop video cards. They have some kind of funny quirk. The, the, the drives didn't work properly or something, so people have been using virtual GL as a workaround. I'm not sure of all the technical stuff that goes into that, but um, yeah, it's a pretty cool app, so I just thought I'd mention it. Okay, nearly to the end of the lightning talks. Anybody else have a last minute lightning talk that they'd like to give? So next up it'll be uh, Sirdhar with uh, CBIT and All PC Australia. So I guess that's a double lightning talk. One for CBIT and one for All PC. They each, they each warrant one lightning talk. One minute and then... Hello. I don't really need these. Anyway, so um, <coughs> uh, so I was at CBIT yesterday, and did anyone here go to CBIT at all? Um, so might be interesting to have a discussion later on. We've only got five minutes here, so let's not do that here. Um, but um, uh, what astounded me, I hadn't been to CBIT in years, and, and previously, maybe three years ago, I might have been at CBIT, and I used to run the Linux Australia stand there. And... Um, Back then, open source, the concept of free software, Linux and so on, related technologies, was very much a sideshow. It was, it was one of those technologies that we knew was running the internet, it was running the world, but your average person didn't know, they didn't care. And, and so what, one thing that uh, Hanover Affairs, the guys who were running, who do run CBIT, um, did um, for a number of years was have an open source section the CBIT. And that, that was great to bring the concept of open source and free software to the fore. Um, on the other hand, it sort of ghettoized them. It was an area that people could just forget about, avoid if they wanted to. And, but at the time, it was um, given the state of the market, given the state of acceptance in the general population, it was required. What I'm finding now, I went this year and that section is no longer there, hasn't been for a number of years, but it's not needed. What I found was great was I just walked around and people are just talking about Linux. People are promoting it as if it's just an, a normal thing. Um, it's well, even better than normal. It's actually a, a, a tool um, to use for market advantage. Um, and so leaving aside all the philosophical benefits of free software and even the practical benefits of open code and all that stuff, the fact is it stands, it stands on its own right. Um, um, if, if, just against proprietary software, it just works, and I think that's a wonderful thing. All these, th all these uh, concepts and ideals that people who've been in the free software community, like myself, for many years, have been um, trying to agitate for, has actually happened, and it's actually, it's actually realised that um, a lot of key key products and very useful um, bits and pieces in the marketplace are so heavily reliant on free software, even if there's a proprietary facade on the front. Uh, that's what a facade is. Uh, there's behind the scenes. <laughs> behind the scenes, it's it, it's very heavily based on free software, and um, that was that was a wonderful thing. So moving moving on from there, how much time I've got? Yeah, yeah there's plenty. Um, so this is all impromptu. I didn't plan for this at all. But um, my, my wearing my other hat for a second. I'm I'm engineering manager at One Laptop Per Child Australia, and um, um, one thing one thing I do is that I produce um, produce technology based on free software that um, that gets put into schools and um, and does many many wonderful things that cannot be achieved quite so well with proprietary software and most importantly it's it's based on a solid educational foundation with teacher training and so on and so forth um, 
a lot of you have probably heard my spiel on that before, so I, I'll stop there. But what is interesting is the big project I've been working on over the past year is a new Model XO laptop. Now, I didn't bring one with me, unfortunately. Couldn't be bothered lugging it around. If you've seen an XO before, it's a green clamshell-like device. Um, it, um, the new device looks exactly the same because it was such a wonderful form factor in the first place. It was extremely rugged. It's field repairable. Even by children, we've proven that. We've got lots of kids who are doing that. Um, and but we've we've added a touchscreen to it, and so we've got this device that is dual mode. It's got a keyboard. The screen, since the original X01, has always been able to swivel down, swivel around, and fold back on itself, so it looked like a tablet. Uh, back in 2005, when the X01 was announced, people thought, "Wow, that was awesome. That was pre netbook days." Nowadays, people look at it and go, "That's nice. Is it a touchscreen?" It's funny how people's expectations have changed. Well, now we can say it is. And we did so maintaining all the benefits of the XO. It was It's still rugged. It's still field repairable. You, know, you can't do that with, you get a consumer tablet, you drop it, it's stuffed. It doesn't have a keyboard, which isn't useful for children's literacy. It isn't useful for actually creating content. Um, so we, we actually had that. In addition to that, let's see, I've got 30 seconds left. In addition to that, in Australia, we've... we've uh, sure. Oh, okay. Well, I'm, I'm near the end of this anyway. Um, so... Um, um, the what we've done in Australia is we've taken that XO4 Touch that has been developed at the global level, and I've been quite involved in that creation. And then we've created our own variant of it, which we call the XO Duo. Duo meaning that is uh, it is dual purpose. It is it can be used in a full touchscreen environment, and it can be used in a keyboard. Now, in addition to the benefits um, um, that 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 brings, and all the improvements that are, that has been have been made there to for instance, in the software stack, there's been a huge amount of development to um, to make it touch enabled. Um, um, it's it's Linux based, it's GTK based. We migrated to GTK3, which brings a lot of extra touch um, capabilities by itself. Um, um, we've got screen rotation happening. It's got um, accelerometer, all of that stuff. In, in addition to that, um, we've really put a focus on children's literacy. So I've been um, um, I. Um, I, I've been heading up the design of a new literacy font, which is which. This is something that really astounded me: the fa the fact that um, um, that in educational environments, children just get foisted these foisted upon them these these devices made for grown-ups, devices made for office workers or for general consumers. And um, uh, one thing that was that was mentioned to me was that children learn writing in a particular way. And in fact, let me correct myself: they learn in particular ways. Um, not only because each individual child is different, but also because handwriting is taught differently in different states, not just different countries, but different states in Australia. And so the New South Wales font for literacy is different from the Victorian font, which in turn is different from the Queensland font. It's, it's strange. So um, I looked at all those designs, and um, then I looked at the available um, typefaces out there, especially the free software fonts. There are some very good, very high quality free software fonts, but none that met our requirements for teaching literacy. And then I worked with some designers and some um, typographers to um, get um, get the. We got the Deja Vu font set, which we we use that as a base. Um, that the Deja Vu fonts are extremely high quality. They're used by default in a lot of uh, uh, Linux distributions. And um, then we made some some uh, subtle yet very important modifications to the characters. Now, I wish I had, I wish I could show some screenshots because they were. Um, yeah, next month I can do that definitely. I'll be more prepared. Um, but um, those those little differences make a huge difference to the children. And the benefit is that we've got that font now being used on the sc on the screen is the default font is the default text entry font. It is also used on the keyboard. Now, there's the hardware keyboard. There's also the software keyboard when you're using it in, in tablet mode. So, yes, Patrick. It's a sans font. So it's based on Deja Vu Sans. Um, so there are, there are numerous debates over what's better in different circumstances. I won't get into that because uh, des designers like to fight wars over that. Sorry. <laughs> the only answer is Comic Sans. <laughs> you can flog me later. Um, yes, so um, um, yeah, I'll show, I'll show some some pictures later on because that really that really makes it clear. But um, um, what's important is that this is 
at the end of the day, this is a device that has been made specifically for children. There is nothing else like this in the world. And um, I, and I also think it's our best, our best bet of getting true free software um, that is that is actually made for children into the classroom and integrated into the educational system, not just something forced on top. This is not another digital education revolution. This has proper teacher training and, and uh, full full integration into curriculum. Um, so that um, we've really thought about this. We've really thought about this end to end from the hardware to the the educational program to you know you name it. We've probably put some thought into it and, and put some addressing into it. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Um, I've known Schrader for a short while now, well, actually a long while, and he's not really done anything useful. He's only sort of promoted course and been the president of Linux and, you know, worked for OLPC. So he's really actually not done anything of particular use or note in his entire life until he got married just a short while ago. Congratulations, Schrader. <laughs> Okay, any other uh, surprising announcements? Yep, one minute talk. Yes, we have one minute talk. You're getting married next month. Sorry? <laughs> what? Sorry? You're getting married next month. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I've got married once. Once is, once is enough. Um, this, is, this is just going to be a one minute talk on uh, two languages which I've been playing with recently. Um, one is Rebel, which has anybody heard of Rebel around the room? So, yes. So it's a it's a language which was written by the Carl Sassenrath, who is the creator of the Amiga operating system. It's been around for 18 years. It was closed source, but it was recently open sourced uh, just December this year. Um, so uh, there's a lot of active development to try and kickstart it. But if anybody's interested in a language which has its basis in uh, Lisp. Uh, but without all the brackets. Um, fourth, and uh, is, is very compact, very concise, and very simple. The whole uh, installation is just one half meg uh, executable with zero dependencies. Then, yep, there's a, there's a very active Stack Overflow chat room it's called uh, Rebel, Rebel and Red. Red is another language. While, while, the, um, while it was in a closed source state, and somebody said, well, this is such an interesting language, I'm going to try and come up with my own variant. So this guy called Doc Kimball came up with a compiled variant called Red, which is also fascinating in the sense that it's um, all built, uh, it, kind of, it, it kind of dog foods, it builds it, it's, everything is built from the ground up in its own language. So there's no even compiler. So in the sense that it doesn't use GCC. I would like to do a more detailed talk, and I will try and get some, some materials to actually do a talk another time. But it's really a call to action. If anybody's interested in this kind of language, um, there's a yeah, Stack Overflow, there's a chat room function on Stack Overflow, and there's a Rebel and Red chat, chat room. So very, very friendly bunch from all around, including one or two people in Sydney. So uh, please come and join us. OK. Any more? One minute, quick. No, I think we've uh, pretty much got up to seven. So I think we'll take a five or ten minute break while David sets up. And um, yeah, if there's uh, anybody else who'd like to give a talk another month or, um, or if you'd like to hear a talk about something, sometimes um, even just the idea for a talk can be useful. And yeah, we'll take a five or ten minute break. And um, back in 10.